welcome, Denise. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Denise is a thought leader. I read a book that Denise wrote, and I put it in the invitation, and I was very impressed by the capacity to create a process about leadership and how do we influence other people and motivate other people and inspire other people. And I had the fortune of meeting her a few weeks ago and invite her to our Wealthy Talks, and she graciously um, agreed to do that to Denise. Denise, welcome to our talk. Thank you so much for being here. And let's start with your journey. How did you get here? Wow, it's uh, lovely to see you, Alicia, and uh, happy to, to walk that through. You know, I, if I look back, it, it was definitely not a straight line. It was, you know, kind of veered all over the map, but I started out my career in uh, the technology industry. And I spent a few years doing the software journey. So I worked in marketing, I worked in product development, I managed product teams, and then eventually I did international business development. And the, you know, it was fun for a while, but I kind of burned out. I realized after, you know, a number of years that that was, I, I'd done the software world. <laughs> but fortunately, in the middle of that, I, I got an MBA at Stanford, and uh, while I was there, I met an amazing woman leader who had this vision about helping women entrepreneurs really scale big businesses. And together, we came we came together to start a trade association for women entrepreneurs right out of business school. And the organization was growing while I was in the tech industry, and I was kind of running it on the side. And uh, finally, after a few years, we realized, wow, you know, we got to get serious about this. So I stepped out. And I ran the organization full time, which uh, at the time was called the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs. Um, I also had the chance to start a venture conference, the first one called Springboard for Women Entrepreneurs. And that journey was just this amazing joy. Uh, but when I left, the organization both continued. But when I moved on to do other things, I, I got a phone call one day from a friend and she said, you know, Denise, how you became that thought leader in women's entrepreneurship. I want to do that. And I remember thinking, I was a thought leader, really? Like, that was not something I'd ever called myself. And, and that took me to where I am today, which is for the last number of years now, I've really been focused on how can people, and particularly women, make that journey from leader to thought leader. That, you know, this is the place of finding your voice, uh, finding your bully pulpit, getting your seat at the table. How do you do that? How do you make a difference around a cause you care about? How do you become that purpose-driven entrepreneur or executive? And, and that's really my work today. And I think it's all based on all this amazing journey that I've been on and all the different places I've worked and the wonderful people that I've met, but really a calling to do something for women. So I, uh, this, is, this is very interesting because I never really thought about any difference between being a leader and being a thought leader. And as I was mentioning before, I, I spent a lot of time working with entrepreneurs and the general understanding is that most women want to have small businesses. Uh, I, uh, I have a lot of discussions with my PhD supervisor who's an expert in gender issues and debt. And he was under the understanding that women really want to have small businesses. And I said, no, women might want to have a big business, uh, but it's, it's about choices. It's whatever you want to do. And so when I hear you talk, I thought, wow, this is great because if you, it doesn't matter if you have a small organization, you can still be a leader. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what is the difference between a leader and a thought leader? And do we really need to develop those skills? And what are the things we can learn about it? I, I do think we need those skills. I think we need both skills. I mean, I do, I look back, I had this amazing mentor in my career who taught me about leadership and he, he had this, this, this framework that he had called VRE. He believes that, that leadership is about vision, relationships, and execution. And that most of us, when we get hired in our first jobs, and even when we start our own businesses, all we're worried about is that execution, execution, execution. But over time, we really have to understand that it is about the relationships that we can leverage in order to get bigger things done. And then over time, time, it is the ability to set a big vision and to enroll other people in how 
to come together to, to create something bigger. And that's when you can start growing your business. And, and for me, if you take that, that V of the vision piece and you take it even further and imagine that you are really trying to change your industry, you're trying to change a cause that you care about, you're trying to change work, the way the world is working for women, for example, that takes something beyond just advocating for your own company, your own products and services. It requires, I think, a set of skills that are really about building coalitions, understanding what it means to manage multiple stakeholders, understanding what it means to frame a message so that others can pick it up and carry it forward. So to me, the main difference between a leader and a thought leader is that leaders are usually talking to just the people that they, they touch every day. They actually can see and work with and touch the people that they are trying to influence. Thought leaders are trying to influence beyond the people they can touch. So they're creating what I call from one to many to many to many. And when you do many to many, you have to motivate people and, and empower people to take your message and carry it forward. And I think once you're in a bigger company, of course, you need this skill in your own company, but you also need it in your industry to make change. You need it in, around a cause. All of that is, is the conversation of thought leadership is one to many and then many to many. That's so interesting because we tend to think that uh, we can let me just know that we tend to think that we can only be leaders with the people that know us that uh, are directly influenced by that but this is this is much beyond that because we get inspired by so many people that we've never known and they they still reach us and this is a very very powerful concept what do you think are the the, the key issues that people need to learn or need to practice or to to develop that well, I think the main one is this, this recognition that you do have a voice. So it starts with a mindset. It's a, it starts with a sense that I am expert enough in whatever my area is. I think with many people, men and women, but particularly women, we tend to downplay our expertise. We think I'm not yet expert enough. And yet for me, it isn't so much about being that, what I call the, the sage from the stage. You know, you don't have to be that all knowing oracle, but instead what I call the guide from the side. You want to be on the journey with the people that you're trying to influence. Mm -hmm. I think when you, when you shape a mindset around guide from the side, it allows you to understand that thought leadership isn't when you're 90, you know, you don't have to wait that this is, we're all figuring it out together, whether it's we're making a change in our industry and trying to get things to happen in a different way in our organization or, or around a cause. So I think that's the first thing. It's sort of a mindset. I think the second thing is a set of skills. So a set of skills around being able to articulate a big idea and being able to enroll people. Now, that's the same skill an entrepreneur needs, just even to get anyone to come on and be a vendor, to come on and be an employee, to come on and, and buy your product. So it is sort of amplifying that skill. And then I think the third piece is really this, the relationship piece that I talked about earlier, which is the idea of being able to um, enroll others to take our ideas forward. So finding the champions, finding the amplifiers. We, of course, amplify others, but we are trying to get our message to be so interesting, so crisp, so clear, so compelling and exciting that others want to take it forward. So I always think about people, you know, Sheryl Sandberg with her message about lean in. That's, that message had been said many times before, but she crafted it in a way with this very simple, crisp articulation with a lot of credibility and good, um, good research behind it that, that started to carry it much, much bigger. But she also created these lean in groups which allowed people to come together and move forward this idea so i think it's it's a little bit of um fresh thinking for people often um, but it starts with that courage to believe that you matter and that your ideas matter and that the change you're trying to bring about really must happen so i i take it from you that this is really beyond uh, the an egotistic view of being a leader. This is more about transformation. What about a change that you want to be in the world or that you want to influence in the world? Is that correct? Uh, yes, and I do think that it's a key differentiator for entrepreneurs. If you are trying to raise money, for example, or if you're trying to break out within your organization, as that thought leader, that go-to person in your field or 
someone with a big idea, it's far more likely that you're going to stand out. You're going to be that person that others want to invest in because you're kind of the it gal or guy around that particular cause. So I think back to the sort of the early day early days of Salesforce, right? This guy was trying, uh, had a Salesforce was trying not just to have people buy Salesforce, but he was trying to transform an industry. All software had been sold in a box before. Now everything is going to be online. You have to get, that's a transformative idea. And it brings up a lot of concerns and a lot of change in a lot of worry in people's minds. Well, you can't just tell people, go buy my software software. And I think that's true for many of us. We think that all we need to do is talk about the benefits and the features of our products over and over, but that doesn't motivate people. People don't trust you if all you're doing is talking about yourself and your products. So I think this idea of stepping into a bigger story, a bigger message, a bigger framework, you're far more likely to get people to go, hey, that, yeah, I, I want to talk to him or her. I want to learn more. I'm interested. They kind of, you know, talk about lean in. They start to lean into your ideas. And I think that really brings in, that enrolls employees, that enrolls uh, funders, and it certainly enrolls people to want to purchase from you. That, that's very, very interesting. Is that part of, uh, does, does this uh, came about through Springboard as well? Or did you, you know, it, it, it really, my journey began there. Um, you know, when I think about this journey I was on, I was all about how do we get more women funded? How do we change the, the statistics, which at the time when I began was less than 1% of venture money was going to women. And I, I used to think about this, if you think about it as a giant poster, like 99 men and one woman, like I kept saying, let's change the poster. I want 50%. Well, that message took me all over the country. It took me to tons of media, conferences, even meetings at the White House. I and mean, we really were convening people. We were arguing for our point. We were taking any bully pulpit we could to, to champion for this cause. And, you know, we didn't make that much progress sometimes, it feels like. But we started this venture conference springboard. And that allowed, that opened the door to an enormous amount of press and new people coming forward, new organizations across the country who were stepping forward saying, we're working on this too. We want to lock arms with you. We want to help, right? And that, I think, that journey that I was on as being one of these few people really with this message, it was such an incredible, it was like the phone never stopped ringing kind of experience. And you, it was the right person at the right time with this right message. And it was the hot time in Silicon Valley. There was tons of money. And it was, you know, I was kind of the it girl for a short period of time. But when I look back at that and I think, I had no idea what I was doing. Like, no idea. I really, I never thought of myself as actually you know, I, I just wanted to grow my nonprofit. I wanted to grow this conference. I was really kind of heads down and all these opportunities came at me in this wonderful way, but I didn't know how to leverage them. I didn't know how to really take advantage. And yeah, I, I look back now and I think part of the reason I wrote my book is because I really wrote my book to that younger self. I wrote my book to uh, give all the things I had learned in, since that time. And the book I wish I'd had, like, and when I was starting out, as that, that phone was ringing, if I had known what I know now, I could have done that so much more effectively. I could have really understood the power of coalitions. I could have understood the power of simplifying my message and, and really understanding who else to link to. I mean, there's so many things I didn't know. And that's kind of what I'm on this crusade now. It's like, how many people can I give this, this expertise and this mindset to so they don't get, either they don't miss their opportunity or they don't, you know, kind of be an accidental thought leader like I was. <laughs> I do have a question uh, from uh, some of the people that are listening to us. And uh, this is a woman and she's saying, how do I make sure that I don't lose momentum? Because sometimes I get back home and I feel uh, this is a lost case. Uh, I I am in I'm impressed about what you what you did when you started, and we're so far behind in my country. Uh, how do I make sure that I keep uh, trusting myself and I'm on the right track and I'm not going to just lose my time doing things that I think are impossible? 
Yeah. Well, first of all, you will keep doing things that are impossible. And that's <laughs> the only way change happens, right? I, I have looked back at myself and I think, you know, even 20 years later, we haven't made a lot of progress around women and entrepreneurship. You know, we still have very little money going to women. So it is easy to get dissuaded and it is easy to get a little cynical. Like I'm never going to really make an impact. But I think the two things that I, maybe there's three things. I think the first one is ask for help. Like if I would say the one thing I've most learned in my life is I didn't ask for help enough. I did not ask for help enough. I kept thinking I'm some superwoman and I got this. Well, of course, the more I had people on board, the more I had a board and an advisory board and the more I had colleagues who were in with me, volunteers, all these people who were helping, man, we moved so much faster and further. So the first thing is ask for help. It's hard. I will. I don't want to downplay it because we get taught that that's a bad thing. But you know, that's just if we have a big vision, the only way you can possibly accomplish it is with a lot of help. I think the second is something that I do. Somebody told me the best thing to do is to get a little index card, like three by five, and write on there your top ten reasons why you're doing what you're doing. So really having your why messages really crisp, and then carry that darn thing with you everywhere. I did my little index card. I put it by my bed. I took a picture of it, and I carried it on my phone, and I looked at that thing all, all, all the time. Um, and then I think the third is really having the humble understanding that we are part of a chain of people. You know, if I think about the women's movement of which I feel like I'm a part, that has been going on for 100, 200 years. And so we cannot do it all ourselves, but we are standing on the shoulders of giants and we are hoping that others will stand on our shoulders. So being a little patient with the fact that, you know, it, we are trying to do, maybe I'll paraphrase Martin Luther King, you know, we're trying to, 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 to change the arc of justice towards positive and and that's that's the little piece we can do is part of many other pieces and maybe together we're building that platform for more to stand on and and to recognize that you're just one piece so don't think that you have to do it all that we are part of a big big effort and thank god we are <laughs> so there are three three key pieces of information one is ask for help or support uh, the other one is build up a reminder of why you're doing that. I actually, I call that a repository of inspiration because yes. that helps me a lot. And uh, I run a program called Women Get Funded. And on the very first, very first session, I asked them, right, um, record a video of yourself of one minute or less of why you're doing this because you're going to need that because you're there's need it. people telling you you're you're crazy this is not going to work or whatever and you're going to have to go back and then and then the third one is realize that you are a part of a bigger uh and more um uh, larger uh, um uh transformation and and uh, i think that's very telling i also think about my my mom my grandma and I think about my daughter and my granddaughters and my son and my father too. Yes. And, uh, and that's going to lead me to the next question. I, I have like 15 questions, but that's going to lead me to the next question, which is, do you think there's really a difference between men and women? Or do you think that's more related to, gen, uh, to uh, uh, age? Or do you think that's more related to race? What are your perceptions about women's leadership with reference to men? I think that there's two pieces, and I think it's a wonderful question. That I, I was in the grocery store, this is a little side note, but I was in a grocery store yesterday and I was looking at all these um, vitamins looking for something, and I saw this, this set of pills that said testosterone pills. I'm like, maybe that's what I need, right? So I'm oh, kidding. Wow. <laughs> but I do think at some point, some of this is hormones. Like we are not driven as much by our hormones are driving us to be one way and males' hormones are driving them to be more aggressive, more assertive, right? I know I have already a lot of that is sort of an aggressive part, but I do think that, that there is a part of this that is just biology and we have to accept that. But I do also understand that if you have a dominant culture, and in the United States, the dominant culture is white male over 50, right? You have a dominant culture. You have to learn to adapt. If you're, in, if you're white and you're male, you don't have to learn to adapt. If you're white and you're female, you have to adapt a little bit. If you ha or you're not, if you're a woman of color or you're a male of, of color or you're someone from the wrong 
side of the tracks, whatever that might mean, wherever you are, you have to keep, it's just like the number of adaptations are high. We call this, this concept is habitus, you know, you're Habitus is the way you grew up. It's the language you learn to speak. It's the it's the way you learn to dress. It's the cultures that you learn to fit in. And what as human beings here, I think, especially as businesswomen and as leaders, we have to be able to adapt and adopt more and more types of habituses, if there is a plural to that word, that um, that we can operate in. We have to be more nimble. We have to be more flexible, and we have to keep. It, they, um, expanding our habitus uh, comfort zones. And I think that's hard. And it, you know, it's hard whether you're going from very poor to more middle class to more rich, or whether you're going from you know, a, a culture of all white to not, whatever it might be, you have, a, you have to keep being more nimble. And that's, it's exhausting, it's hard work. It's, it's, there's, no, there's no guidebook, right? There's nobody to tell you how to do that. And so I think it is harder. Mm. Do you have, uh, have you uh, faced or felt the imposter syndrome? We talk a lot about the imposter syndrome and, uh, and uh, one of the uh, participants is, uh, is writing to us and telling us, well, you seem to have been born in the right place at the right time. And that probably was what gave you all this courage. I, I happen to defer, I think, uh, it doesn't matter, it's just your personality and you carry through. But, but uh, she wonders if you ever felt that uh, you were suffering from the imposter syndrome. I will confess that I've not really struggled a lot with that. I, I, I don't know why, but I've always been pretty confident. Um, ever since I was a young girl, I've always felt like I can do this. I come from a family of a strong mother and three, you know, I'm one of three girls and my, my father, and mother, but both, you know, pushed me out of the nest early and taught me to be resilient. Um, I went to a women's college, which reinforced a lot of those messages. Uh, so I, I'm fortunate that I don't often feel that way. Um, I don't spend a lot of my time comparing. I think comparison is, as my mentor says, is the root of all unhappiness. As soon as you're comparing, you're, you know, you just have, have that it switches your brain into the wrong place. Like instead of admiring other people, you're, you're want to put them down. And I, I just don't spend a lot of time with that. And I, I really want to invite people to put the comparison stuff away, put the comparison stuff aside and, and go back to what your mission is and what you're driven to do because there's a lot of work to be done and we don't have time for this we just don't have time for this um so i think that's kind of how i think about it and people probably are going to hate me because i say this but i'm i just think we ought to get to work and stop worrying about what we don't have and get focused on what we do and what we can move forward no i, th I think that's wonderful because that that opens up a whole discussion about what do you need to do to execute and not to just think about it um, but um, in, in, along those lines, I, I have some uh, of the participants of the program that are mature women, and they never thought about being successful in a way, in a professional way. They, they wanted to get a job, then they had kids, and they quit, then they have their small company. I happen to think that being an entrepreneur is a great career choice for, for moms. Uh, but I also think it's a great career choice for anybody. Uh, but for me, it worked really well. But uh, we have uh, a large group of uh, people that are mature women, and they never thought really about uh, what I call shining with their own light. And they're sort of rediscovering themselves. And um, uh, they, they probably never thought about the imposter syndrome because they were never uh, that competitive. I, I would have to leave it up to them to discuss that. But is there any tip that you can give them? Because some of them feel that they've missed out uh, a lot of years and they're playing catch up. They're not concerned about questioning why they did this or that, but they feel that they don't have a lot of time and they want to learn very, very fast they want to get there fast do you have any advice for them i wow it's a great question i would say my most important advice is to think about reverse mentoring and here's what i mean by that you know what can we learn from people who are younger than us we tend to want to when i go back to asking for help we tend to want to go to somebody who's like 
the guru or the expert or who's older than us or more experienced. But the tr truth is the people who have more time and more patience perhaps are somebody who who's younger at whatever we're doing earlier in their in their learning about it because they're excited about what they're learning and they want to share it so i think it, particularly in technology you know sitting down maybe not with your own kids because maybe they're not very patient with you but you know younger people um who can help you i think can be very very helpful the second thing is the thing i wish that i'd had when i was younger is that just so much stuff you can learn online i mean whether it's youtube or whether it's an online class so i think that's the second is to really um, uh, to stick to some step-by-step -step process in learning where figuring out where you can learn and then I think the third is to realize and here's my sort of funny part of point of view you know everything that your kids went through and you went through with your kids in the on the playground in the sandbox is exactly the same as corporate America right now like people do not change from kindergarten we are all still and so every skill that you taught your children about how to deal with bullies how to deal with classy people how to deal with people who throw sand i mean it's the same skills to deal with radically obnoxious people in the workplace and people like vendors who don't cooperate it's all the same skills so just imagine that what you've been doing as a mom is hugely valuable and recognize that you all those things you taught your kids you are going to put to work every day in dealing with all the crazy people out there they don't they don't change this is great i just had i just has three comments from from younger women uh in the group and, and they say i wish uh she was like my auntie <laughs> I'm going to share that with my mom. And I, and I do actually have a, uh, a, a little session where I call it Bring Your Mom, because I think what is happening now, it's amazing between moms and daughters and the, and the level of encouragement and support from daughters that, that see all the potential in their moms. So they're bringing them back into the game. You're not going to retire. And uh, now with a lifespan um, more uh, longer, there's more and more people that want to have a you know a second career late in life and that's uh, and they're very excited about that this is this is really really great uh, i want to jump now to another question about leadership and um there's two women from latin america and they uh and there's one guy too and they're discussing whether women tend to be more collaborative or if this is a fallacy fallacy uh, there, are, there are three co-founders of a company, and uh, one, of the, one of them is really strong will, and that happens to be a woman. And, um, and they're debating of, over whether uh, they should let her take the lead in, in having the difficult conversations, not only with investors, uh, but also with suppliers, or if, uh, or if there's anything else that they should be looking into. Wow. Uh, it's really, really, really hard to generalize men versus women. I, I heard something early in my career that I've always been wondering if it's true, and that is that, that men collaborate internally and they compete externally, and women compete internally and collaborate externally. And I've never been able to prove or disprove it that as a male, female, we should do some assessments using the strengths finder, for example, which I really love, or the disc, or some of the typically wonderful leadership assessments out there and really look deeply at what are the skills that the three founders are bringing to the table and divide the work based on the skills rather than the gender, because I don't think gender is a useful tool in this skill, in this capacity. There's a researcher at Stanford who's been doing some really interesting work with founders here in Silicon Valley, and she hasn't published it yet, but I heard her speak about it. And she talked about how the most effective startups are the ones that divide the work by the skills and don't think about it as a box like you're not just marketing or you're not just sales or you're not just this or just that that they don't silo instead they regularly reassess the work that's coming and think who has the best skills to do that and even if I'm doing a little sales and I'm doing a lot of marketing and I'm doing a little of this and doing a little of that as long as we keep talking like regularly every month about the work ahead and thinking about where are my strengths people are much more satisfied they're more committed to the work they're more likely to show up the next day because they're playing with their strengths and that's one of the things that I think is the most important thing for all of us if I'm doing work every day 
that I hate, you know, why am I showing up? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's very valid. Uh, let me ask you something else. Uh, what do you think has been the impact of the early work in women's access to capital? And do you see a change? I have my own opinion about that. But do you see a change in uh, women's access to capital, especially in the last three to four years? Oh, I think it's been a huge shift, huge. I mean, I don't, unfortunately, the numbers in the venture capital space are not, um, are not showing the full story. Like the full story is, we didn't have all the uh, crowdfunding, regular crowdfunding, when you think about so many more angels, we think about so many more opportunities to um, find the micro VCs, et cetera. I mean, there's just all these different cat categories of capital that didn't used to exist. And, and also there's way more women investing now than there ever was before. And so when you put all those things together, and then there's of course much more information about how to seek funding, there's a lot more now knowledge about how to write a great pitch and how to be ready and I've got a lot of thoughts about that but the there's I think it's like the prime time plus at least in the US there's a lot of money sloshing around out there right now and so it's a good time to be raising money and a good time to be um, to, to capitalize on all these amazing ways to, to raise money for your business it's kind of shocking social impact investors didn't exist I mean think about it there's like five new ways to raise money who knew that that was gonna happen <laughs> Do you think people need to come to the U.S. to raise funds? I don't know enough to know the answer to that. I know that there's a lot of money here right now. Um, I don't know how long it'll last. I, I've seen three cycles in my career. Um, you know, the first one was the dot-com craze where there was just a ton of money. And, and here's how I used to describe it to the press. I used to say, you know, they, the women get funded at the end, at the peak of the, of the money. It's because they run out of the white men to give money to. So they would fund the white men, the Indian men, and the Asian men. Then they would fund the white women, the Indian women, and the Asian women in the U.S. And it was like, that was the pattern back in sort of 99 to 2001. And then it all crashed. And then there was no money for women for a couple of years. And then sort of 2005, 2006, the money came back. Women started getting funding in 2007. And then it crashed again and then there was no money and now we're back women are getting funded again so we're like we're on this third wave but as soon as you see women getting funding i think you want to watch your own money because i think the market's going to crash because at some point they <laughs> the valuations get crazy for the men the male CEO. And, and then the whole thing blows up. So we have, we have to get our money when we can and these moments, and this is one of those moments. This is a great moment. And then sock yeah. it away, sock <laughs> it away. Any, any lessons learned from the previous crashes in the Valley? <sighs> I, wish, I wish there would be one lesson that the market would learn, which is to look under the covers of these companies before, and, and my, them more carefully. I mean, what I see is a lot of making up the, the facts about what you're going to do. You know, there's a lot of these hockey stick, uh, this is, we're going to make, you know, $20 billion in the first three years and whatever. All, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but that's exactly what's happening. There's a lot of exaggeration and there's not a lot of the due diligence that happens in these sort of in these big money times. And I think that's very, very, very dangerous. And then the second half of it is the lesson we don't ever learn is to monitor. I mean, when you look at what happened, and it's a very sad story to look at the story of Theranos and the woman CEO there, you know, one of the first women to have a billion dollar valuation on her company, but it was all lies. And, you know, that is not just women, but when it's women, it's even worse because there's so few of us. We really, it shows, it, it, it's worse and worse for us for the next one to get funded if somebody does that. But this is not just the women who are lying. It's not just the women who have, you know, make up a tissue of lies about what's happening under the covers. And the boards are not watching the P, minding the P's and Q's. And I think that's the biggest lessons I've learned. Wow, yeah, I, I forgot about that. I, I need to, uh, can you explain a little bit more about Theranos or should I just uh, leave it in the, in the uh, 
Uh, well, for anybody who has not been following it, I've been kind of glued to it because I met the gal, um, Elizabeth, when she was very young. She was just coming out of Stanford. I met her just as she was leaving Stanford, and she started a, a company with a lot of promises in the medical field that said that they were going to be able to prick your finger, take just a teeny drop of blood, and be able to run 100 tests against it for your health. And it turns out that it was all lies. And she put a bunch of people on her board, but every one of them was a, you know, a former diplomat or executive, none of them come from the medical field, none of them had the capacity to do that looking under the covers, none of them had the ability to, to monitor or the willingness to monitor. And I think she um, and her co-founder, I mean, and the guy she brought on who she was involved with, and there was a lot of life about that too, I think that there was just an enormous amount of, of promise and not a lot of truth to what was happening. And so, you know, it went up, it raised hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and it completely crashed. And so there's a great book called Bad Blood and I just finished it a few weeks ago and it's, you can't, can't put it down. Like I started it on a Friday and I finished it on Sunday. I couldn't put it down. So it's really partially for me because it's first major story of a woman entrepreneur doing that. And I think it's, it's heartbreaking to see that the women can, can do just as badly as the men. Yeah, we can. <laughs> badly. Uh, yeah, we can. Uh, another question that comes up is what can other minorities, or I, I wouldn't say minorities because as somebody pointed out, they're not my, the minorities, they're the majorities, uh, especially in some uh, developing countries. But what can other people learn from women who have been able to overcome their challenges? What are the lessons for other people? I'll, I'll tell a funny story. I um, So I was running this trade association for women entrepreneurs and I hosted a dinner one night for a lot of really, really, really accomplished women entrepreneurs in the Valley. And there weren't that many, maybe 10 or 12 who'd taken a company public, who'd been really successful. And um, <laughs> I remember my co-founder and I sat down for dinner with them at this really fancy restaurant in this private room. And I was, I was fascinated to listen to them. And I, I came away with three three things from that night. Lesson number one was how fascinating it was how many of them had been mentored by the same few men in Silicon Valley and they didn't know it. So I thought that was interesting that, that, that the men who really were, I mean, they, and they were very big names here in the Valley, Scott McNeely, you know, the guy who was the chairman of Intuit, um, they had been mentored by those, those people. And I think that that's fascinating is looking, the lesson for me is look for those men who have power, who, who really um, recognize the value of women and they recognize the value of women leaders because they can take you far. Each one of them told the story about this guy put me on his board, this guy hired me, this guy promoted me. And it was the same few men. And I thought that was, that was one lesson. The second lesson I, I took away was um, these women were tough cookies. I, and some of that has changed. Like we're talking 10, 15 years ago, that was kind of the only model was to be really, really tough. And I think now we have a few more models of leadership. But I came away, I remember saying to my co-founder, like, would you work with any of these women? <laughs> And we all said, mm, I don't think so. <laughs> so I think that, that was the scary part of the evening. It's like, whoa, these people. But the other funny moment of the evening was how many of them, and, I, and this is consistent not just from this dinner, but from many women, is how many of us were told somewhere in our career that we were too this, too that, to the next thing, too aggressive, too assertive, too bossy, too this, like just exhausting number of too this, too that, that was told to us over and over. And I would get that to me, if you really think about it, if you were given that message along the way, that probably means that you're on the right track, right? Because <laughs> it is, it's exactly what they don't want you to think, but it is in fact a message that says, yeah, you don't fit, you don't fit this little box that we want to put women in, which means I think you have the power to go much further. And I think all of that time, as you mentioned earlier, you know, we're told a lot of the times you're crazy. That's a really stupid idea. How, to me, that's the, also another sign that you're on the right track. The more people that think you're really nuts, the more likely you are to change the world. So you need both of those. You need the messages somewhere along the way that you are not like everybody else. And that's a positive. And look at that as a positive. And then secondly, look around at the 
things you're doing that people go, what are you thinking? And keep doing that because it's probably where a big change can happen. <laughs> that that's actually true. That I, I, I right? I, did you get that message when you were young? Oh, of course, of course. And people, oh, told, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna fail. Uh, there's there's also. I know we're running out of time, but I if you, if you can stay for another ten extra minutes, I have I just have a ton of questions for you. Um, sure. This is tied up with something that I've been told all the time, which is that women can't have it all, and I completely disagree with you. I think you can have everything that you want. Uh, you just have to plan and you have to say no to some things that you didn't want to do anyways. But I, I do think that you can have everything that you want. What are your views about that? Mm. So, this so is, my college... Sorry, this is especially important for the young women who are in, in our platforms and the young men that are with them. And they don't want to have their, their spouses or their partners compromise and feeling that they're not going to be able to do things because they, they are in love with a guy. So what, I remember graduating college and my, literally at my graduation, the president of my college got up and she said, so I wanna just say to all of you graduates um, that you can have it all, you just can't have it all at the same time. And I remember sitting in the audience, I'm 22 years old or whatever, and I remember being really mad. Like, how dare you? I, I can do everything. I can do it. I'm just like, I'm amazing. And I felt so empowered graduating from this wonderful school and, and having these chances ahead of me. But looking back, maybe 10 years later, I, I think I understood more what she meant. And that is that it is very, very challenging to be everything to everyone and, then the, and most of all to ourselves. And I think if we keep this bar being so high that I have to be the perfect mother, the perfect daughter, the perfect employee, the perfect employer, whatever it is that we're setting to ourselves, community member, you know, whatever, it's, it, it will burn you out and it will um, exhaust you. And it goes back to that whole comparison thing that we talked about earlier. Like if you are constantly comparing yourself to some bar that is absolutely impossible to achieve, that perfection bar, it, you, first of all, you never get there. And second of all, you wear yourself out with the comparison. You wear yourself out with that, that being angry at yourself because you didn't get there. And my attitude is like, First of all, bring the bar down a little, realize no one is everything to everyone. And if they are pretending to be, it's probably a tissue of lies, right? So we have to recognize that. And secondly, is, to, is that I think happiness comes so much from being grateful for what we have already accomplished and from where we are today, right? I don't say I spend a lot of time looking back, but I do think we should recognize and, and honor and respect the journey that we've already been on and the challenges that we've faced and overcome because that's given us the resilience to stay and where we are today and then secondly to be grateful for the people around us for the opportunities we do have to even try to have a few of those things that we have. and the other is to recognize that you're not alone like every woman every woman goes through this and i remember when i was running my trade association fwe um in the whole 10 years that i ran this organization i literally never had one program that was ever about work-life balance never and I remember leaving there, and right after I left, the new CEO who came in hosted a program on that, and I remember laughing and saying, the reason I never did is because I thought, it's impossible anyway, so why are we doing a panel on this? <laughs> like, why bother? And one of my co-founders, who never really agreed with me about this, she said, yeah, Denise, but at least people might get some strategies. And so that's my last point about this, which is look around you for the strategies. There are other people who've been down this road before, and it's part of that asking for help is, hey, how did you do this? How did you do that? How in the world do you do this? Because it's, somebody else might have already figured this out, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Asking for help. Well, we have a, a ton of uh, observations about that ask for help. And, and I think it's related also to the culture. And in some cultures, you don't ask for help unless there's a relative. And uh, there's, a, there's a key question here that I think is gonna be very telling. How do I ask for help if I cannot give anything in return? Mm, oh, that's so, that's so juicy. Um, okay, so one of the 
things that I think is important, first of all, is that let's talk a little bit about how to ask for help. Uh, you know, there's, when we ask for help, we think of it as a lower and an upper. We think of the person that's asking for help is down here and the person we're asking for help is up here. I don't think of it that way. I want to turn it on its side. And I want to imagine that this is, for the moment that you're asking, it's a partnership. And that people actually enjoy being of help right? They actually enjoy teaching, they enjoy sharing their expertise, etc. And that it is in some ways a gift that you're giving them to be of, to, to let them be of service, to let them be that person who is sharing their knowledge and expertise, being the expert for the moment but how we ask can also shape that like you don't actually have to go in and say can you help me which can make us feel like we're below but instead is is in, enrolling somebody in the conversation in a different way i'd love to get your thoughts on I, I know you're a real expert in this what have you learned about it which is a completely different way than me here you here right it's more hey you know i've got you learning you've learned something help me along that path where you've already been and then the second is um or maybe the third is to say okay maybe i can't offer anything to this person but thinking back to the thinking next or thinking forward is what i'm thinking about thinking forward to the next person that you're either going to be able to pass that knowledge that you just learned to or something else that you know so this is for me about paying it forward and and also realizing you'll have a chance to do your helping of someone else there's so many people in the world that i have helped for no you know no money no time you know, no recompense of any kind but maybe they don't come back and help me but boy somebody else does right so it's like that whole what goes around comes around the more we believe that a rising tide raises all boats and we're all here to help each other we let go of some of that shame or fear or doubt or um uh, concern about asking because we think that they that in some ways we're not bringing enough to the party so I want to I hope that gave a lot of thinking about how to reframe this in your mind and how to rephrase so it's like reframe and rephrase this this and then recognize that over time you will be giving it you'll be doing your part for someone else that, that's really good. And uh, I, I myself, I've struggled with that because I don't tell people I want to help you because I think it's diminishing and I want to have more of a horizontal relationship. So the word I use is support. And I know Correct. that when I was talking to my grandkids. So it, it's okay for my grandkids to ask for help. It's okay if somebody asks for help. But for me to, to go out and say, I want to help you, it just is, didn't feel authentic to me. So I, I wanted to explore other things and the way you, you frame it was really, really beautiful because I want to have more of a plain field. And I also learn a lot by, by talking to somebody else and it expands my boundaries. But I also know that people don't necessarily need to have uh, a, an immediate or instant reward to, to be able to support somebody else. It, it, you know, this is exactly what you were talking about, that leadership. This is exactly why we are here, uh, sharing our knowledge with somebody else. And um, I want to wrap this up with a conversation I had with a Sikh um, guide uh, when I was in Delhi a few weeks ago. And this guy showed me around and I was making food for the poor next to the temple. I was just making chapati and, and talking to, to the people that were there. And uh, we were talking about what are the things that we share with other people. And in my mind, it was always about time and money. So when I was poor, I had more time and I gave some time. And when I had more money, I have less time, but I gave more money. Or I, I, I always try to keep that balance. My kids are the same way. But this guy told me, you also share knowledge. And this is really transformational. And this is the beauty of now. Um, all the access to internet and to information where we can make such dramatic change you know the power of i bought your book at a at a um, um at an airport going back to australia and and then when i got there my husband at the time i bought the same book and we're sharing that i said oh this is so great and here i am and i meet you and you know even though before i ever met you you had already had an influence in my life and you already have had an influence in so many people's life without really needing to have that instant recognition and i think that's very important to to raise that we are not in the world alone we're we're all in this together and that's really really very much so.
absolutely. And, and even letting go of that phrase that says, my culture doesn't allow me or doesn't expect me. The only way we change cultures is we change that mindset that says we can't, we shouldn't, or it's bad or whatever, to say, this is the new way. The 21st century skills, the 21st century future is that we're all locking arms and we're working towards a better future. And that doesn't happen if we're all hiding under our beds thinking we've all got this. You know, we've, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. I was, um, you know, the, the market was really crashing in 2002 and it was really painful time to be living in Silicon Valley. And the money was drying up and, and companies were closing. And, and you know, I'm running an organization at the time called the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs entrepreneurs. But every time the phone rang, it seemed like it was some guy and he was calling up to say, hey, um, I see that one of your sponsors is this big accounting firm. I really need to connect with them. Can you introduce me? I see that you're involved with why, first of all, why are all these men calling me? Because it says women on the door, right? But secondly, where are the women? I mean, the women's companies were and I realized that it, the same thing was true of me. My organization was really struggling and I was all but hiding under my bed. I was like covers over, didn't want to tell anyone. I just wanted to hide because for some reason there was a global economic meltdown and I'm thinking it's my fault. Like really? I'm <laughs> <laughs> you have to really laugh at that. But it is ridiculous if we think that we can do everything in our lives together. The guys had no trouble calling people that they didn't even know that weren't even there to help them and thinking that, of course, I'm going to help them. And the women were, even though I'm there, designed, they're paying membership for me to help them and they're not calling me and I realized I was exactly the same as they were and we had to just like smack yourself and go okay this is craziness whatever message we got is not the new message the new message is we're all in this together and let's figure it out and as soon as I did as soon as I told everyone on my board my advisory board my sponsors my vendors everybody that we were struggling all kinds of answers started to come out of the woodwork and and the organization just celebrated its 25th anniversary as a result it would not have happened if i had stayed under my bed it just would not have happened we would have gone under i think this is amazing i i, I never thought about that and i i never thought about asking for help because i thought i was a, a lesser person if i asked for help yeah. and that is the truth to me uh, i was i was also an immigrant so i moved to a lot of countries by myself or with my kids and um, I was very scared that people were going to think that I was crazy, which probably I was by moving countries like that. But, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's a, I think it's transformational to realize that, you know, you need to step up and ask for help. That's actually making you a bigger person. Uh, and we can help each other, right? And the, all the women on this call, all the people on this call, we can also, you know, not wait for the phone call to ask for help. If you see someone who you could help, just do it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, we're running out of time. Uh, I know that you've been doing some work about leadership styles. Do you want to share that work or do you want to close this with some key tips for the future? of socioeconomic development in women's, uh, in people's growth, not just women. Yeah, I, I want to close with some tips and some ideas. And, I, and I'll just leave with one or two of my key things that I hold on to when I'm, when I'm feeling stuck. And, and one of them is when I was in business school, I took this amazing class called Creativity in Business. And they had us actually write a, a, like a mission statement. And, and it took me a long time to do this exercise. I was really struggling with it. But I came out with an, a, a very key phrase that I've lived with ever since. And that is empowering others is empowering yourself and it really ties to all of this conversation we've been having all of the work that I do now is tied to that story and and it has been it's allowed me to have the career that I've had is, is just living that phrase and then the second phrase that I live by is one that my very first mentor said to me and she said if you're not living on the edge you're taking up too much room <laughs> and I've always 
I've always loved that. And what do I think of when I think of that? I think it's about risk taking. You know, I would never have started the kinds of organizations. You would never have moved to other, you know, other countries, especially with small children, if we weren't living on the edge. And so if you're going to set out to, to live the life that you really dream about, and, and so you will have no regrets when you're 103 and you're looking back, it's like, don't take up too much room, like live on that edge take that risk and really um, live full out and play full out because it's the only way. That's, that's my take on it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think it's, I think it's pretty awesome. I, um, that resonates with something that I said when I was young and I've lived up to it is um, I don't want to have a boring life. I want to have a life that is worth it. So yes. it's okay. It's take a risk is fine and it's and it's fun. And, and it's now fun. That I see my kids and my grandkids and, and the infants and other people, it's fun. And I'm very, very fortunate to have met you and we're very, very fortunate to have had you uh, talk to us. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, we're gonna stream this forward. Um, especially we have a large, large amount of followers in uh, Asia. So they're waking up today and uh, some of them were early on and I'm going to stream them so they can take advantage of that. Thank you so much. And thank you. Everybody. It was lovely talking with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.